What is going on, Diesel Nation? We're excited to have you guys with us today on the Diesel Podcast. Today, I'm going to be joined by Caleb. He's a truck editor at The Drive, and he's written some recent articles about the EPA enforcement, chatted with a lot of industry leaders, also covered some topics pertaining to states that are going after people selling deleted trucks. And so we wanted to ask him for some more information, get a you know, kind of inside look at what it's been like to cover this topic and things he's learned through the people that he's interviewed and what his thoughts are on the future of diesel and especially the aftermarket and how the aftermarket can uh, you know factor into all this so it's going to be a really interesting conversation before we get to it we want to thank uh, one of our sponsors which is kershaw knives we appreciate their support of the diesel podcast they've got a code to save 20 percent off site wide if you use diesel 20 at kershaw.kiausa.com you can save money on a ton of different things they have of course they got a ton of knives they also have other things you could use for the outdoors fishing um and really for any budget which you know that's what's so cool is whether you need something that you're going to be using you know hard um, outside every day or you want something to show up to your friends um ton of different options for opening mechanisms materials blade steels they got a ton there so make sure you check them out also if you're watching on youtube and you're not subscribed to the diesel podcast make sure you subscribe turn on the notifications like the video comment on it let us know what you think of the episode let us know what you think of the topic if there's questions you have or we didn't ask something you know i didn't think to ask the guest something um i always check those i can ask them uh you know get them back on ask them that question doing that helps us reach a lot of people that are searching youtube for answers to questions on a truck build or how to um, approach you know an engine or pick a turbo build or just you know are searching things and we want to reach as many people as we can help them get the answers they need and, and be able to share the guest story their insights and their experience all right let's get to today's episode with caleb and chatting about how some states are going after people selling deleted trucks and then also this bigger topic of epa enforcement what it's doing to the aftermarket and some of the insights that he got from people he interviewed for his article Caleb, welcome to the Diesel Podcast. I am excited to chat with you today. A listener of ours had read your recent article and said, "Hey, see if you can get him on the podcast to you know report back, um, you know what uh, you know what he found, what his work involved." So I'm excited to chat with you today. Yeah, of course I am too. Thank you very much for having me. I uh, I think that this is an important conversation to have, and it's one that I put a lot of work into uh, understanding. And so anything that uh, I can help shine some light on, I'm happy to. To, to start, tell me a little bit about, um, you know, the magazine, what you do, your background, you know, as far as being a journalist and getting into the automotive side. Yeah, of course. Um, so I have been with The Drive for, let's see, it's been nearly six years now. Uh, so it's all online and I'm officially, officially the site's truck editor. So I speak specifically on anything that's uh, you know, work-related, off-road related, four-wheel drives, towing, anything of that, um, that kind of falls into my wheelhouse. And so I, uh, I currently live in the Missouri Ozarks. That's where I've grown up. So I've always been in the middle of the country. I know the importance of trucks. I've grown up around them. I know how people use them. And so I think that, uh, you know, helps qualify me a little bit to speak on that specifically. Well, I, that's what that's what really came through in the articles. I could tell that you're a truck guy, and you know you're you're familiar with them. And you know, I've read articles in the past. <laughs> I don't remember <laughs> which particular. It was a New York Times or New York Post, and it was something about diesel smoke. And <clears throat> I could just tell that whoever wrote it had no idea about the subject matter. So <clears throat> I think that's what came through to me, and also some of our listeners that that uh that read it as well and so that's why i really wanted to have you on today was to talk about your article because it's so comprehensive in the work that you did and you presented that i wanted our audience to to hear about it so uh, tell me what inspired you to you want to cover the topic and then the process of getting all the information and interviews that you did yeah of course and so I, like I said, I've done this job for about six years now. I've always been interested in trucks, but prior to, I think this May, um, that wasn't my specific area of focus. So I've written a lot about cars, you know, in that time, written a lot about trucks, all kinds of different areas. Um, but whenever I became the site's truck editor, I knew that this was something that I wanted to explore. This was an important story and it's one that we've just seen become more relevant um, through the past, you know, probably three years. And so uh, I actually wrote a story on Mike Siebold, uh, a diesel truck owner out of New Jersey, who's been contacted by the Department of Environmental Protection. 
and uh, talked back and forth with him a little bit, talked back and forth with the state just to learn uh, exactly what it, what the situation was. Essentially, um, the state of New Jersey found him trying to sell his deleted 2008 Cummins uh, on Facebook Marketplace. I know that that's been a pretty popular story in the diesel community. Um, but after talking with him and seeing uh, more and more fines being dished out, seven-figure fines uh, to companies, uh, I, I, I decided it was time that we should really dive deep into it. So I spoke with my editors a little bit. Um, they were you know, relatively familiar because we'd covered the news um, of these uh, like court decisions, I guess is the best way of putting it. And uh, I really elaborated to them that this is a big deal. This is something that involves a lot of enthusiasts and just everyday truck owners too. So um, that's how that's how the foundation was poured, and and we just went in uh, went into it from there. So it was a it was a pretty extensive pro- process, but it's one that I'm glad that we did. That uh, story from the truck owner in New Jersey, I know that one for me and like doing this podcast for six years and covering this, that one shocked me because I think that was the first time I'd ever heard of a state finding an ad or being told about an ad for a truck for sale and them actually taking action, you know, with it. And I think from the article, you know, they gave them a certain amount of time to put it back to stock or something like Mm -hmm. that. And that's really the seriousness of it is I think in general, as a truck enthusiast, you know, we have a tendency to think, oh, it's just about a company and a fine. It doesn't pertain to me. Um, It's not going to pertain to the place I take my truck to get service and stuff, but it really does. And so, you know, when you jumped into this, this article and started to cover it, how did you decide where to start first? You know, was it a particular uh, side or particular a person you wanted to interview or how did you approach telling this story in such a comprehensive article? Uh, so if you're talking about the one specifically about the EPA and the diesel after yeah. market, um, I just kind of thought on who's the most important um, and most, most like a, I guess, public voice in all of this. So people who have been very vocal about diesel tuning, uh, you know, the potential government government overreach that's been brought up. And to me, the first person that came to mind was Corey Willis, uh, somebody who has really gone through it with, with the government lately, but has also turned to clean diesel tuning. And uh, knowing that, I also thought about Gail Banks. So I had talked with Gail Banks in the past, there's no one that matches his expertise whenever it comes to engine building. As far as I'm concerned, that's not to say I've met everyone that has ever done it, but just listening to him talk, it's, it's amazing. And so I knew that through our previous relationship that I'd likely be able to get in touch with him. And uh, so to have Corey speaking on that as somebody who um, has kind of gone through the rigmarole, I guess is a good way of putting it. Uh, been dealing with the federal government in that sense. And then speaking with somebody like Gail, who has pretty well always been emissions compliant whenever it comes to trucks that are on the road. Um, just interesting to hear both sides of that. And, and Corey and Gail have had an operating, you know, relationship of sorts. You know, they, they post about it on Instagram. You know, Corey's been at the bank shop multiple times. They did a podcast episode together. And so it all made sense to talk with them. And uh, of course, just need to reach out to the EPA and hear what they have to say. Uh, it's not the easiest thing to get uh, the exact answers out of them that you want, which is to be expected. But uh, the fact that they did, you know, entertain my request and, and did send over a statement, you know, I was appreciative of that. Um, people can make their own assessment of, of their of their response, but the fact that they were willing to go on the record so that way we could uh, discuss it in this this type of forum. I mean, I was pleased with that in the very least. And for people who haven't read the article, and I hope they do, and I encourage them to do that after they, you know, listen to what we're chatting about is, is what would, what's kind of the summary that you heard from Corey Willis? And then we'll go into the conversation with, with Gail, um, as far as the questions that you asked them and what they told you. Yeah, of course. Um, so a lot of Corey and I's discussion was me asking one question and then hearing what he had to say from there. Um, so one point, um, in particular that he harped on was that it gets to be pretty unrealistic um, for these diesel aftermarket companies to be held to specific testing requirements. In his case, under his consent decree, uh, you know, he, he operates pretty much under carb rules and that's a uh, really expensive to go through. Um, a lot of shops that aren't established aren't able to, aren't able to pay for that kind of testing. And so that was one side of it that um, he discussed, but also uh, government overreach, like the 
the part that we saw with John Long, um, who's the owner of Open Wide Diesel Performance, um, he was visited at six o'clock in the morning by EPA agents who came. They had a battering ram. You know, they had firearms unholstered. Um, it was a pretty, it was a pretty shocking visual, and um, it was recorded on his ring doorbell and then posted online. And so uh, he just went into his discussion of that, um, and you can read that all in the article. You know, I don't, I'm not, I don't have anything. Uh, definitely not going to put any words in Corey's mouth, but I feel like it's pretty well fleshed out uh, in my piece that you can see his opinion on that. You know, um, he speaks on there and says that he believes the EPA is essential. You know, he's for clean air and clean water. Um, so it's not like this is somebody who denies everything about climate change or, or anything of the sort. It's just a matter of crackdowns being uh, being applied in the right places, I guess, uh, more more or less. Uh, on the shop versus the end user. And uh, that's what he's really trying to take a stand for. That was one of the things that, uh, that I really took away from it. And also, as I think about some of the podcasts or the information that I read is that there isn't, there isn't a, a lot of access for companies or manufacturers to be able to show the testing that they need to show to either to sell it in 49 states or of course they can go to car but i know that sema garage has jumped in to help a bit with it but it's been sort of an ambiguous process to do it and i think if that became more streamlined it would definitely help tuners and <clears throat> other companies to be able to go through the process to confidently be able to say hey this part does not increase emissions output for what this particular year range of motor was certified for the customer can buy it with confidence they don't have to worry about it <clears throat> as far as where they're driving or or anything like that so that was a really big takeaway that i got from you know what Corey was saying and you know when i think about banks i i do think of products for a long time i don't know more than 10 years definitely where they have tailored those products to be able to be emissions compliant. And I know at one point it might not have been the most popular, but in the long run it was. And so, you know, on that side of it, what would you say, you know, were some of your main takeaways in your discussions, um, you know, with Gail or with them about their approach to aftermarket parts and diesel trucks? Yeah, of course. Um, and so, you can hear Gail talk about it on his own speech shop podcast. Um, he, he talks about uh, working on um, race specific vehicles, right? Um, he mentions that he's not ever been in the business of deleting diesel vehicles for the sake of competition, because the ones that he works on never really had them in the first place. So he has the, he has the experience of working with some really, uh, really interesting projects that most most aftermarket companies, they're just not, uh, they don't have the same access to, I guess. So whenever you think of Gail Banks, somebody who, you know, has a contract with the U.S. military to <laughs> work on these super specialized vehicles and, 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 um, and pretty well just find the best way to get the most performance out of them reliably, um, you have to, you have to look that there are two sides of that coin, right? So whenever Gail talks about emissions that's not to say that he's never worked on a truck that isn't emissions compliant uh for road use but whenever he has worked specifically with with racing vehicles it it goes back you know more than 40 years uh, he he's he's done this with so much experience so i guess i should probably rewind it a little bit and just say that gail has always been a strong proponent of emissions compliance because like I mentioned in the article, he was a key reason um, that CARB even allows vehicle modifications in the first place, um, so long as they don't tamper with uh, emissions control devices. And so I mentioned in there, Gail worked for 10 years to, to get this vehicle code, I believe it's 27156. Uh, and that allows aftermarket companies to produce parts that increase performance, so long as they don't uh, tamper with vehicle emission systems. So, um, I understand why he's passionate about that, you know, uh, for somebody who's put that much work, you know, and, and so many years of their life into it, you know, you can't blame him for that. And uh, agree, there were definitely a lot of critiques uh, over him not deleting trucks. But as we've kind of seen now, you know, even, even with Corey, you know, clean diesel tuning is really the only way forward for the aftermarket. Um, you know, it, at the very end of my article, Corey says, if there's somebody that thinks they're going to, you know, slide one past the federal government, they're wrong. I think that's a really powerful statement. 
you know, if that's coming from, you know, what, what I would say, who I would say is, is the top diesel tuner. It's like, okay, well, then that's the way it is. I, I think that Corey speaks with a lot of authority on that. So to have him uh, to say that, and then also have Gail give his expertise and, and, and just experience with that over the past four decades. Like, I think that uh, is pretty clear cut in my opinion. Well, I, I think the importance can't be understated with trying to get a car process in place to test parts because from my understanding with people we've had on, they have said that almost as that the EPA basically relies on carb testing as a model or a standard to be able to say, hey, this part um, doesn't create more emissions out of this vehicle. So without that in place, I think it might have taken longer or been harder to, you know, for a company or someplace to come up with a testing standard or a way to do that. Um, with the EPA, this, this is something I wanted to ask you about the statement that you mentioned is, you know, what, what did they tell you and, and how was, what was the process like to try to get them to answer, um, you know, a question you had or a series of questions as it pertains to you know, diesel emissions and diesel trucks? Yeah, of course. Um, so it's not like I have to, you know, find somebody's most personal information and, and track them down at their house. Like this stuff is available online. You know, you can find their contact info there. Uh, and and after that, you know, it's pretty well up to them if they're going to respond or not. So I, uh, of course, reach out. I, I tell them exactly what I'm doing, you know, what I'm reporting on, uh, who I am and, and the outlet that I'm with. So I got in touch with uh, one of their spokespeople and pretty much just sent them a specific list of questions. I, I asked about the uptake in enforcement lately. Um, I asked how they distinguish between a vehicle that's meant specifically for competition uh, and, and one that's uh, strictly for the road. Um, and whenever they sent the response, even though it was long and pretty in depth, it didn't answer my specific questions to a T, if that makes sense. So um, they kind of had an idea of what I was looking to know and they responded in the way that they wanted to, but um, I think that it still gave us something to work with. So um, you can see in there that they mentioned that they're, they say they're not going after um, the racing hobby. I think that's something that uh, causes a lot of controversy because some people would disagree with that. Uh, that's the EPA stance. Um, people that I've talked to that um, have close relationships with people within the EPA, they really believe that they're doing important work to to save the planet you know i know that sounds kind of hippy dippy but it's the truth um that's the way they feel that's the conviction that they operate under and uh so it seems like it's it's almost like they operate in two different worlds the diesel aftermarket and epa in some ways that's not to say one is more correct than the other but uh, i think that there's definitely a disparity there in understanding um that it's it makes it especially difficult to agree <laughs> yeah yeah, you had mentioned earlier that that ring video of that EPA raid, and I remember when I first saw it, I, you know, I was I was shocked because I'm like, this is this is truck parts, it's diesel parts, you know, it's not some other thing where I could envision a federal raid. But we had a shop owner on um, recently, a couple weeks ago, that talked about his experience, and he said something really important to me. Is he said that they don't treat this any different than any other federal felony, so that's why the intensity is there the manpower, the local police, federal agents. And that was my first kind of inside look at what happens when you're going about work that day and all of a sudden there's 10 or 20 people and, and sirens out front. And I think in the, the article that you wrote, how in-depth you went and the perspectives that you got really helped paint a picture for the, the, the truck user, which is 99% of the people that are going to hear this podcast are guys who own trucks and they, they wonder why don't – I see these parts anymore or why can't you know i bought this used truck and it has tunes on it why won't anyone retune it for me and we'd love to help educate people and your perspective is the first one we've had which is with a journalist with a with a writer you know talking about it so it's so cool to be able to get your perspective as someone working on something putting it together getting these different sources you know kind of all lined up and i wanted to ask you through this process of, of writing this article um were you able to chat with any shop owners, any of the like small businesses that may have been affected or may not have been affected, but were just, you know, you came across them and they were worried about it or asking questions. 
So the main one that I talked to was John Long, the one whose home, you know, um, was was searched and, and his product was seized uh, by the EPA. You know, I would I would certainly count him as, as a small business owner. Um, and yeah, I mean, there was there was just a lot of shock and awe involved in it because, I mean, he was at home. It was six o'clock in the morning, according to him. And, uh, you know, pretty strong knock on the door and he answered. They didn't bust down his door, but uh, to be greeted by federal agents, you know, unexpectedly, he said there was no prior contact with him before that. Um, that was one part that was a little surprising to me. Um, of course, you know, you can only go off of uh, what these people tell you and uh, and try to fact check it as much as possible. But uh, for that to be the initial uh, form of communication is, is shocking. Um, so outside outside of John Long and his case, I didn't uh, I didn't speak to anybody else that uh, kind of fits in that same category because I wanted to have him, someone who has been involved with this, uh, you know, with this crackdown uh, or a series of crackdowns as, as a small business owner. And then also talk with Corey, who is somebody that's done it for the better part of a decade, somebody who's been really prevalent in the diesel aftermarket. And then, uh, of course, talk to Gail, who has been emissions compliant and, and done it for so many years. So um, speaking with them, it really helps to, I think, provide a fully formed concept of, of how this is changing versus 10 years ago. Um, so I, like I said, I live in the middle of the country. I've seen trucks being deleted, you know, the whole time that I've been able to drive, you know, I guess maybe that reveals my age in a way, but, uh, <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a common thing. And, uh, people, I think people that don't, uh, maybe aren't aware of it, they, they see it as, as like a fringe case, but this involves a lot. So this involves a lot of people. This involves a lot, a lot of drivers and business owners. So, um, that's why, that's why I went into it with, with that kind of lens, I guess. It is more mainstream than it had appeared. And I think maybe a lot of it might've been because these guys couldn't talk about it, which was one thing that shop owner had told us is like, you know, you're not supposed to talk about it. And so it was always kind of kept quiet. You might hear things if you knew people in the industry or knew different shops, but it, it affects every, really everything, any website you go to, um, different product lines, tons of different things. And it's, I, I think I don't remember if it was the end of I think it was the end of 2019 when the EPA had a release about in, in enforcement of delete devices, and so they they said what they were going to do, and you know they did it, and you know I always heard oh you get some letters in the mail, um, you know they tell you that they want information, but what you mentioned um, with John and what our guest mentioned is there was nothing it was just they show up one day, and it's uh, you know really intimidating. And uh, you know, different. Not, most people aren't used to that. So I, I appreciate what you've been able to to uh, share, you know, with truck enthusiasts, so they can see that, you know, and they can understand it. And if I was to sort of transition a little bit and have you step back and ask answer this question as a truck enthusiast or say a diesel enthusiast, where do you see from all the information you've gathered, all the people you've talked to? the future of the diesel after market going is it in that either you know a lot of people are buying older trucks and they say well i want to go to pre-07 so i don't have to worry about this or kind of what you mentioned with banks and being able to make these products that work in an emissions on capacity and there's other companies corey's tuning there's compound turbo kits there's lots of things that have carb numbers for it but what's your opinion on the future of the aftermarket so I don't see the aftermarket as winding down. I wouldn't say that. I would say that there will be fewer players who are able to be in that space. You know, um, whenever it takes this much uh, time and especially money to get parts certified, then yeah, it's it's going to become more exclusive. Uh, you know, it's not going to be possible for for all the small shops to manufacture parts and sell them in mass, especially if they have to be responsible um, for whose hands that ends up in. Uh, I think that's probably the key thing. So. Uh, I, I do see it's still existing, you know, um, I, I've, uh, like I said, I haven't always just written about trucks. And so I have some experience with electric vehicles and, you know, I've talked with key people within, um, you know, like automakers like Ford, uh, the F-150 Lightning chief engineer, Linda Zhang, you know, I've spoken with her um, about what the, what the main challenges are for producing a, a heavy duty truck, you know, that's electric. Uh, there's a lot that goes into it. Uh, whenever you think about, um, you know, like gooseneck hauling, just for example, um, that's not all that easy whenever a vehicle has independent rear suspension. It's like 
right now it's really there's no way to do it with the FM50 Lightning. And so what I'm getting at is that transition is still fairly far away. I'm not going to say that it's 20 years out. Uh, definitely not. But I think that there's still going to be demand for these aftermarket products. There are people that still enjoy doing this, um, whether it's for competition purposes or for their daily drivers. Um, I think that it's just going to be a lot stricter on uh, the parts that they buy. Uh, makes it makes it a lot. Uh, it, it it narrows the the field. I guess is a good way of yeah. putting it. So I think that they're going to be you know required to buy from these companies that do all the testing. They spend all the money to make sure that it does things right. Um, but I, there are still going to be there are still going to be people uh, in aftermarket companies specifically that offer that. Um, I can't speak on you know like margins or anything like that, but I would say there's still money to be made, but it's going to probably increase for the end user uh, because because it takes so much more money to get something certified. Um, so it's it's going to change. It, it, it likely won't be as accessible, you know, for for everyday people. It's not to say that it's going to be impossible, but um, there's definitely there's there's changes going on right now. I think that we're going to see more of the same in the next few years. Uh, just depends on on how strict they want to be about uh, about enforcing and uh, how far they go with that. But it's I think it's impossible to say right now what it's going to look like in ten years. I think the diesel tuning will still exist. But I think that it gets a lot smaller um, than it has been, like during the 2010 specifically. Yeah, yeah, there was a lot more, a lot more that were out there, and I think a wild card in it too are states. Like we had started off, um, you know, in New Jersey, there's 50 of them, and how are they all going to approach this, you know, as well? But you, you mentioned something <clears throat> that it made me think of a question because you, said you cover things other than diesel. And a lot of times diesel enthusiasts will think, well, the EPA is just picking on diesel. They don't do anything with, with the gas world or anything out there. Do you have any information or insight as to how there may be enforcement in you know, the gas world with this? Or is it, is it mostly focused on diesel trucks? I'd say the diesel trucks are a big focus of it, but they're definitely not the only ones. So it, it applies to race shops just the same way um, that focus on gas vehicles. Um, Excuse me. Uh, it's, it's definitely not limited, not limited to the diesel world. Um, you know, I, I we've written about that pretty extensively in the past, just uh, like the RPM Act. I know there's a hot topic of conversation. You know, not all those guys are truck guys. A lot of those people, um, you know, they do like import drag racing just the same way, you know. So whereas it seems like uh, we're the, the diesel industry is, is being targeted because they're you know, maybe loud or brash or, or, or the most vocal about disagreeing. Um, I really don't see it that way. I think that it becomes higher profile and people see that, oh, wow, there are these companies that have been doing this and, and made a lot of money off of it. Uh, that's, I mean, that's just the plain truth. That's not anything uh, negative against them. They're successful in their business. But I think that's why we're really seeing it. And I think it uh, fuels the public, uh, their response even more because some people are very for people being able to modify their trucks and and do it how they want other people really have a pretty strong disdain for <laughs> for you know black smoke in general and so um i think there's a lot of stereotyping involved that's not the way that it is for everybody uh but i think that's why we see it in the news so much more and, and plus you know multi-million dollar fines and and, and civil penalties that's a uh, that's a lot so whenever you see that more on the diesel side i think that's why it's more um present in the public conscience. Yeah. Yeah, I do as well. It's, it's something, you know, even by nature, if you hear a loud car, a you know, Mustang, a Camaro, um, you know, a Hellcat or something like that, it's just, you know, it's loud or something. But when you have a truck and it's just blacking out every, you know, light stop, it's just more visually there. And I think people who aren't into this stuff at all, they see that and they, they just hone in on it. I think that brought a lot of attention to it and it's progressed to you know this level this level that it has and you know i know on this podcast and us chatting you know how we have there's so much information we're not going over that's in your article where can our listeners go to find what you wrote and you know be able to read it and you know digest it and you know subscribe and be able to see other stuff that that you're working on and writing even if it's not just diesel it could be other things yeah, of course. So everything is on the drive.com. You know, that's my that's my only outlet that I write for. I'm full time there. I'm there five days a week, if not some more. Um, and, and we can we can get the link, you know, in the, in the description for this podcast. But uh, just sit down, you know, get a good cup of coffee. It's 
3,100 words. I'll be straight up. It's, <laughs> it's, it's in depth. It's thorough. But it's something that I'm really proud of. You know, I think that it's an important conversation to have, like we talked about before. Uh, we talked to arguably the most significant people in this space, um, people who have had a lot of experience and success with it. Um, this is something that also um, kind of like it has a lot of general intrigue to people who aren't interested in trucks. This is something that catches their attention, right? So um, you can find everything on the drive.com. You know, I'm on social too. I, I, I'm not super active on there, but I, uh, this is a developing story. This is something that's going to continue. You know, this is not, this is not the only one that I'll ever write at, at present. It's the most definitive. I feel like uh, I'm proud of that, but I know that there's going to be more, come from it so um there's always more in the works i would say just tune into that um there's no there's no subscription it's all free so you're you're welcome to check it out just the same but uh yeah there's there's definitely more uh to read on the way i think that's a really important point that you made about it appealing to people that may not even be into trucks or automotive like my mom doesn't listen to this podcast, but she listened to the one with like an EPA lawyer or something else because she right. was genuinely interested about what is going on. And there's a lot of people out there the, that are. So even if, if someone's listening and they're not a diesel truck owner, diesel truck enthusiast, I'd encourage them to check out the article and read it and, and see what other information that you guys you know, post and, and write about as well as it pertains to automotive. But I appreciate you, you know, coming on to the podcast, chatting with me, sharing your insights, and uh, you know, explaining what you found so our audience can learn more about what's going on and be able to cover this story. Yeah, of course, of course. And just one more thing that I wanted to add. Um, I really feel like the way we approach this is is unique in our space. You know, we we compete with a lot of other outlets that are respectable in their own right. Um, I just want to make sure that I'm always doing my job and and presenting the facts. You know, not trying to skew anybody one way or another. Um, and, and just being as thorough of a reporter as possible. So this comes from somebody who owns a diesel truck. I, I got a 95.73, if anybody's curious. So <laughs> I, uh, that's, my, that's my daily, even though I work from home. But uh, and I, I uh, owned a 6.7 Power Stroke in the past. So like this is from somebody who is familiar with it. And that's the way that I always want to talk about trucks. You know, somebody who's passionate about it. Um, I mean, that's, that's my livelihood. And so uh, just know that whenever you read it, it's not from somebody who sits in a cubicle um, somewhere that has never, you know, even ridden in a diesel truck. You just see it out the window. I mean, I, I feel like I come to this with personal experience that's relevant uh, to, to the subject. So I am down to have any discussion, you know, like this is important. It, it uh, a lot hinges on it. You know, there's a lot at stake. So uh, I, I feel like our site at the drive uh we're we're really mindful of that so i'm passionate about it i can't wait to see what else comes but i think it's time that somebody really pursues this the way that it deserves to be pursued so uh, i really look forward to what's next well I, I appreciate your time it was a pleasure to chat with you and look forward to seeing what you do in the future yeah thank you very much Patrick. i appreciate it don't forget, diesel fans, make sure and head on over to kershaw.kiausa.com. Use code diesel20 to save 20% off site wide. We really appreciate them offering that to our listeners, supporting the podcast. And it's a great way to save some money on something that you could use at work, around the house, hunting, fishing, or maybe you're just a knife guy and just enjoy knives. They got a ton of choices, a bunch of different blade steels, opening mechanisms, and designs for you to choose from. I also want to thank some of our Patreon supporters. Texas Diesel Supply, Rights Diesel Services, uh, Tyler Lowen at 23 Diesel, Caleb, all of our Patreons, all of you who subscribe on YouTube that are on our Discord, Instagram, Facebook, podcast apps. You guys keep us going, keep us on our toes. Um, really, you know, there's so much to cover in diesel. There, there's so many different topics and, you know, you guys let us know and tell us and we love being able to provide the education and the insights so you guys can make informed decisions choose either the trucks, the parts, or the build strategy that you want, and be able to get information from you know, people who have done it or experts in their field. Until next time, keep the shiny side up.